Um, so coming to you from San Francisco, really excited to be here. Machine learning and AI is always a very hot topic. And um, that is my job, bringing machine learning and AI to all of our startups and uh, our venture capital firms. And today's session, as uh, Christina mentioned, is where machine learning is today and what we can expect from machine learning in the next, we'll say short term, one to three years. So this is not a futuristic look. This is not when will robots take over the world. Uh, this is very much how can you apply machine learning and AI to your businesses today. Uh, and we'll be talking about three obviously very high level themes, technology, business and design. First, I want to introduce myself. So my name is Ali Miller. My current position is U.S. Head of AI Business Development for Startups and Venture Capital at AWS, which is Amazon Web Services. I'm sure you all are very familiar with it. Uh, I've actually been at Amazon for nine weeks. Um, prior to Amazon was lead product manager at IBM Watson, started with conversational AI, moved into computer vision, running product development for about a year and a half. Uh, so everything related to image recognition, text recognition, video recognition. And then for the last year of my time at Watson was building out our multimodal AI team and AI strategy with a team of about 30 engineers. So thinking about AI as a system rather than AI as individual uh, mechanisms and motions. Um, Rather than giving you a resume, I decided to break out my bio into three themes that I tend to talk about and tend to care about. Those three things are AI, uh, society, behavioral impact, and business. So AI I spoke about. Uh, on the societal impact side, I have addressed the European Commission as the only woman in AI, was focused on the future of workforce, studied cognitive science. Um, I think and talk and care a lot about minorities in tech. Um, as far as business value, I have an MBA from Wharton. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor to, to many folks, and I post a lot on LinkedIn. So really where AI is as it relates to societal impact and the business value, how we can actually uh, drive, drive metrics improvement and revenue improvement using AI, that's really my focus. It's not on this high level, wouldn't it be cool if type of research, it's on hardcore applicable productionized AI. Uh, and I'm excited to talk with you about those three themes. Um, I am going to assume that there is some level of familiarity with machine learning and AI, but I'd like to give the non-jargon version of what is machine learning. So ML is machine learning. And this is a very, very summarized view. Um, but the idea of machine learning is that we feed millions of examples of labeled data to a computer. And I'll kind of leave the word computer on its own. There are a lot of different versions of that. But we feed it millions and millions of examples of, let's say, what a cat is versus what a dog is. And the computer is able to make a model to map those inputs to outputs. So able to map the images that it receives to the fact that we labeled it as a cat or a dog. And it's able to look at things like pixels, able to look at things like aggregation of pixels and shapes and blobs. Um, and it's able to start to make a model of those inputs to outputs, saves that model, and then you give it a brand new photo of let's say a dog, and then a computer just provides the output based on that model it's already created, uh, along with say a confidence score. So it's you know 83% confident that this new picture is a dog based on the millions of times that computer has seen a cat or a dog before. Um, so that is very uh, synthesized and very summarized, but I, I've learned that that is uh, helpful to demystify the world of machine learning. It's really just pattern recognition from millions of other examples. And a lot of what we'll be talking about is how is big tech leveraging what we're doing with millions of examples to make sure that new companies have to use fewer examples uh, or where's the world going that can bring that millions down to 10. So that's baseline, what is machine learning? And what we're going to be talking about is 
a few um, specific technologies, namely language, speech, and computer vision. So language, you might have heard of natural language, natural language processing, NLP. Um, and we're going to be talking about these three as far as where they are today, or at the very least what the world expects out of those three today, and what can we expect out of these three in the next one to three years. In addition to these three categories, language, speech, and computer vision, I'm also going to be talking about some general machine learning trends and um, some fun additional foundational development and user experience trends that are also happening. Um, but again, it, it really helps to break these down into like hardcore, narrow technologies so that you can let your brain run, run wild thinking about, okay, how can these technologies really be combined to form an AI system? Um, so speech, you know, that, that is something like speaking to your phone and, and it being able to understand what you're saying. Computer vision is how we think about photos and videos. So we'll be talking about those three. And I, I mentioned that we're, uh, or Christina mentioned, we're going to be saving questions and answers at the end. Please feel free to ask questions about specific technologies, machine learning in general, um, UX, team hires, all of, all of that. Um, but, but we'll start with these technologies for now. So every single slide is going to be structured for what the world expects from X today and then what we can expect from X tomorrow. Um, the reason that I phrased it, what the world expects today, is that one of the trends we can rely on is that the world will always expect more from technology um, than wherever technology is today. So if you know, it can be performed for $1,000, people want it at $10. If it can be performed with 300 milliseconds in inference time or turnaround time, people want that inference time to be 50. So when we're thinking about what the world expects, keep in mind that a, a couple of these are still um, near term within grasp, but the world might not necessarily be there. These are market expectations and ways to think about how you should set your um, consumer expectations, folks that might be buying your end product. So we're going to start with language. Uh, the first category, and this is, again, this will be um, really basic, bringing all of you into the world of NLP, natural language processing. And language is really just understanding words. Those words could be in email, text. Uh, it could be, you know, as your um, thinking about captions or document processing, really anywhere where you're finding text in, uh, in long form or, or semi-long form. So a couple of the things that we expect out of NLP today, one is text classification. So given a category, and that could be topic, sentiment, so sentiment could be happy, sad, angry, um, or urgency, you know, is this really high priority? Does this need to be solved right now? Is this low priority? Um, the model is set to give some sort of answer and confidence score. So the example that I gave related to computer vision, we gave it an image, it said dog, and 83% confident that it was a dog. It's the exact same thing in text classification. So you feed it a paragraph, maybe it's an email that you received from a customer, and it's able to say things like, you know, I believe this is related to billing, and I'm 98% that this is 98% confident that this is related to billing. And oftentimes we just set a threshold for that confidence return. And we say, you know, if it's above 85% confidence score, we'll treat it as true. And we will just deal with it as if it is billing. So maybe it goes into the billing category or it gets sent to a customer support uh, person who knows how to handle billing. If it's below a certain threshold, and I said 85% as just a nice benchmark, uh, I've seen it at 60%, I've seen it at 90. So if it's below that threshold, we might triage it, send it to a human and say, is this billing? Is this tech support? Is this you know, something else? So oftentimes we handle that confidence score as just a threshold and it's not really meant to be uh, viewed by the end user. So again, all we're doing is take a chunk of text and say something about it. We're saying, this is happy, or this is about billing, or uh, this is about you know our California fire, right? Whatever that topic is, um, then do something with it. And that do something with it is often up to the company, right? You can triage it, you can send it around, whatever um, 
you and your business would like to do in that workflow. The second general theme in NLP is high level extraction. So it's not so much um, being able to say, ah, yes, this is about X or the sentiment is X. It's not analyzing the entire paragraph. It's being able to say like pulling out themes um, and those entities, entity could be like a, a noun, let's say, those entities, those words are sometimes found in the paragraph text. So again, let's go back to that California fire and let's say we're, we're trying to summarize 10,000 news articles that just came through. Sometimes the phrase itself, California wildfire, could be found inside the text itself, right? So it's like a search and find. Um, and sometimes that text is not actually found. It could say fire and Napa Valley, but we're able to still say this is about California wildfire based on our training data. So I like to think of it as search and find on steroids. And then the last uh, theme is extractive text summary. And if you just picture like a million documents that came through and you wanna know what are the five sentences that are just really indicative of what this whole thing is about, right? It could be a medical journal, it could be enterprise documentation, it could be contract. And you wanna be able to extract absolutely verbatim what are these top five sentences that are in here? Um, think, think of it as just highlighting a document and, uh, and surfacing those five highlighted phrases. Um, if you think about you know, contract reviews or news article reviews, um, a million emails that came in and you just wanna know what are those top sentences people care about. We think a lot of this is user research. Um, a lot of this is just quick summarization. But again, downside is that it's not so much uh, generative summarization, summarization, it's just literally what text is already inside these documents. The computer's not creating anything new, just finding things that are already there, grabbing it and showing it back. And again, back to you, back to the customer, back to that company. What do you wanna do with that text? Do you want to give those five to your customer support? Do you wanna surface it to your executives and say, here are the five things people care about? Uh, it's really up to you. So that's language today. Uh, in addition to all this, right, people expect 95% accuracy, people expect multi-language. There are pieces that I'm sure you guys can think through as, as customers, um, but these are uh, tech themes. As far as where language is going, um, these, are, these are the fun pieces, and um, it's not gonna be perfect in the next one to three years, but these are going to start to be business themes, um, short-term business themes that we're gonna see in language and how businesses are gonna be applying it. So. One is natural language generation. Uh, a lot of people call this NLG. And you'll see a theme in all of these technologies is that G starts to come up a lot. And G is either general, uh, things that can be applied you know, more broadly, or generative or generation, where the computer is creating something from scratch. So NLG, uh, as I mentioned before, where the AI is really just grabbing text that already exists, this is not that. The AI is not grabbing phrases, words, um, entities that already exist in the document. It's really writing its own. Uh, we're seeing this a lot in weather reports, things that are um, very structured, very expected. Um, we know that weather reports always contain likelihood of rain. Is it sunny or cloudy? And we're just seeing you know, a thousand different ways of saying that same sentence. So we're seeing a lot of AI sampling in these uh, low level tasks of quick NLG in a lot of like voice assistants. Uh, one example that I would love to point you guys to if you want to nerd out on a couple of these things will be related to me being an absolute nerd is that um, there's a really, really fun example about forming opinions on Reddit. So a, uh, a research group um, trained 40 different bots on Reddit subthreads, and one subthread was like, you know, like 1930 to 1960 history, and one of them was about like beauty and makeup, and 38 others, and they put them all in one subreddit where they all got to chat with each other and debate and make arguments and form opinions. And you saw, you know, one saying like, well, I think World War II was really driven by 
this fight and then the 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 makeup bot was like can't we all just get along and i think it really comes down to the you know the shared society of others it's hilarious highly recommended next is abstractive text summarization this is kind of taking nlg to the next level and kind of the the next gen version of that extractive text summarization so it's not you read a million documents you highlighted the five sentences you grab those five and you did something with it. Now it's, we read the million and we're going to create our own opinion of what those million are about. Um, so it could be saying something like, um, you know, we read all these medical journals and we believe that Gen Z is going to have a higher proportion of depression in 2025 than in 2020. That could be something that is not literally written in the document, but the AI is going to generate and create that opinion um, based on the millions of documents that it's already consumed. Uh, the last, and you might have, um, depending on how much you're reading about AI in your free time, GPT-2 is a natural language processing model that was created by OpenAI very recently. If you've ever heard of Dota, a video game, uh, OpenAI also created that. So a lot of like big, big research. The reason it's important to think about research is because that often predicts where uh, the productization of AI is going in the next usually five years. So GPT-2 is a very, very accurate NLP or natural language processing model. And the reason that's so important, it's something like 40 gigabytes of data, 1.5 billion parameters, like it is huge and probably takes hundreds of thousands of dollars to train and then do things with. So it's still saved for large scale research. And again, they've they've only released like a 10% model. Um, the reason that this is important for products and for businesses is because, and I guess I should create like a quick uh, drawing. And I'm sure you guys have seen this is gonna be packed together, but if you ever see an AI like neural net, it's a lot of lines and a lot of like matrixy lines just creating patterns out of those. The reason that that's important is each layer does something additional that highly tunes, tapers, tailors that model to the end use case. So in computer vision, again, it might be like recognizing pixels, then blobs, then shapes, then relations of those shapes. In the world of language, it might be that a period always follows a letter and not a space. Um, that certain letters often go one after the other, uh, that sentences are between you know, 20 and 60 characters. So what those layers allow us to do is that picture like you just can scrape off the last layer, right? Like I make a cake and you scrape off the frosting. We're able to scrape off that last layer and do something else with it. We're able to finely tune it to our use case. Um, and what that means is you're able to remove that last layer and hyper tune it, fine tune it to a specific use case, an industry, it could be manufacturing, retail, uh, media and entertainment, or it could be a specific company, right? It could be Tongle or Calm or any of the other companies that you guys are working for. And because those first layers are so finely tuned, because that cake is so wonderfully, wonderfully made, the frosting, it just requires less you don't need to bring in millions of pieces of data. It's more like the thousands or tens of thousands, which is amazing for businesses in the future. So that is language. Oh, went too fast. All right, speech today, STT and TTS means speech to text and text to speech. Uh, super simple, not gonna go deep into this. It's literally dictation and voice creation. So I talk into my phone, out comes text. Uh, think about, you know, you're, you're watching TV and it's able to take that audio in real time, create caption, closed caption out of it. Uh, the opposite of that is text to speech. I type something or there's text that exists uh, and a computer is able to read that and speak it out loud. Um, multilingual, multi-voice, right? It's not just English. It's all of the top world languages. It's multiple accents within that language, right? English has so many accents. It's being able to understand the Indian accent in English, the British accent, um, and also being able to provide voices in multi-gender. I'm sure you've seen on your phone, uh, on Alexa, you're able to customize what that voice or those inputs would be. And so there is some 
some uh, initial creation of customization that's happening in that voice space. And you'll see that becomes another big theme. Um, and the last is real time. One of the reasons that speech is so important is that it's creating multi-context, right? My hands are doing something. I'm, I'm driving, I'm putting on makeup, I'm holding groceries. Speech is often um, an, an overcoming of my body and my hands, my brain doing something else. And so speech is one of those technologies where there's an expectation of real-time performance. Um, inference, which is grabbing data and creating that output in a safe, secure, accurate way. That inference time um, is often in the, in the hundreds of milliseconds or even faster. Speech is one of those technologies where we expect it to be very, very, very fast, under 100 milliseconds. Um, and, and you'll see a very similar thing with security or video, um, but speech is one of those fast, fast, fast inference times. Speech tomorrow is going to look like voice creation on low data. And I know Frozen 2 is coming out. Um, I don't know why this was my example. I think I saw an Instagram ad for it. But it's um, low data input to build an entire voice model. So right now, voice actors for video games, for brand voices, for commercials, for movies, they require hundreds of hours of audio creation. And so what if that only required a couple minutes? Uh, and so there are some technologies that are starting to come out now. Oftentimes the output sounds very robotic. Um, every E sounds exactly the same. And so it might sound like low data input to built. And you're like, that's eh, kind of alley. It's not like flowy alley. Uh, and so something that we're going to be able to see is natural language, natural voice creation off of much lower data. So a lot of it, like really fun engagement in media and entertainment, video game, and brand uh, brand performance. The next, which is slightly different, is themed voices. So it's not just Siri repeating, you know, in the voice that she does, or Alexa, or you know, even even Kristen Bell and Frozen. It's going to be themed voices for different use cases. So um, calm radio voice to be able to talk you through you know, mental health and to be able to deal with customer support. Or it could be an inspirational motivator. If you're talking about mental health and you, you, know, you really wanna get people out there or you're an excited customer support agent, it's really bringing in those multi-themed um, voices. And, and you know, newscaster, if you're in media and entertainment, um, thinking about those specific themes based on use case and not a general voice for use case X. Um, the other that you might have seen some initial uh, use cases and demos about, this is one of the ones I'm really excited about, is productive voice. So I am producing something versus reactive voice. Um, I am responding to a customer. So VA is virtual assistant. Imagine I ask my virtual assistant to go and make me a dentist appointment. And so what I expect from that productive uh, voice assistant is things like filler words, um, a lot of questions. So I might expect the voice assistant to say something like, um, can we do 7 p.m.? Or, yeah, I think that'll work. And it's a lot more, um, just like I said, um, it's a lot of filler words, it's a lot more natural, it's a lot of inquisitive pieces. Uh, and it's, it's able to deal with potentially um, a, a more narrow use case. When we get into reactive support, that's probably going to be company specific. It's going to include a lot of like trademark and copyright terms. It's going to be probably more um, dictatorial, more answer, more confidence, um, shorter answers so that you're not listening to something ramble on for paragraphs. And again, always think about how much personality is too much. If you're adding in a filler word in between every single word, it's going to be seen as um, less mature, it's going to be seen as taking too long, and so you also want that efficiency in there. And then the last is optimizing based on the user. One of the things that I absolutely despise about customer support and calling into an IVR and, and having a robot answer me is that sometimes I'll call and I'll be like, my appointment's in five minutes, I'm about to walk in an elevator, I gotta get the answer, and they're like, Thank you so much for calling us today. We cannot wait. And I'm like, oh God, why aren't you talking fast? I very clearly made it sound like it is urgent. I am talking fast. I can handle fast speeds. And so we're gonna see that real-time optimization based on what a user is doing. 
Um, it could be that I'm speaking fast. It could be that I'm sad. Maybe I'll get the reaction of a, of a calm radio voice. Um, if it's urgent, maybe I will get triage to a human faster. And so thinking through how are we dealing with that speech to text or text to speech, but in a much more like one-on-one, -on -one, real time, customized way. Uh, I think we're gonna see a lot of that, especially in the customer support world. All right, last of those three core themes is computer vision. And I'm gonna breeze through these so we can get to Q&A as well. Uh, image classification, it's the exact same thing as text classification. It's just data input. And then the computer says, I'm pretty sure it's this with a, with a uh, confidence score. So I give you a photo of a dog. You say it's Labrador, 93% confidence. I give you a picture of a you know, BMW fuel pump. You're able to say, based on all of the fuel pumps we've ever seen that you have told us are counterfeit or real, I predict with 53% accuracy that this is a, you know, counterfeit fuel pump. And that's going to think through, right, you can think of down the line cost savings. Multi-input, um, today it's not just 2D pictures from your phone, though that is probably what we're used to as individual consumers. It's CCTV, it's security TV. It's not just color, it's black and white. It's not just on the ground, it's satellite images, it's video, it's LIDAR to do depth perception. It's hue scanners to be able to see if, you know, oil and gasoline is fraudulent or, or real. Um, those are things that are already happening today in a uh, much broader view than just 2D images from your phone. And then the last piece, which is also related to the other technologies, but very, very prevalent for computer vision, is this idea of deployment. Right? It's not just on a massive you know, GPU and server system on-prem. It's in the cloud, it's on the edge, it's on your phone, it's uh, you know, running on the device itself in a retail location. And so one fact is that an entire ML model is literally the size of three photos on your phone. So the reason that all of these things can happen, this edge compute can happen, is that compute power is so, so advanced today that a, an entire machine learning model takes less space than an app on your phone, uh, which just has completely revolutionized how computer vision is happening in the last year or two. Computer vision trends in the next one to three, we're gonna see a lot of combining of inputs. So right now, it's a lot of you know unilateral computer vision action. It's, I received an image, I told you it's a dog. I received a satellite image, image, I told you if I'm looking at you know grass or sand or if it's Dallas or Houston. But a lot of companies are thinking through what business process um, can be improved when you start to combine all these pieces, right? So your drone plus satellite plus object detection and color detection, all these pieces. And maybe now you're able to say, wow, every uh, lamb that is moving on this farm, you know, all of the uh, like, fatter lambs are going into the west side where the sun is and the plants are growing better in that area. Those are things, right, spatio-temporal um, relationships that are starting to be thought through with this combining of computer vision inputs. Uh, movement of 3D. And I know you guys can, can think a lot about augmented reality. 3D is very much related to that. Stock photos like Shutterstock and a bunch of others are starting to have not just photo of, you know, woman smiling, eating salad, but also CAD drawings and having 3D mappings of, you know, what does a phone look like? What does a notebook look like? What does a water bottle look like? And having these as pre-planned 3D models in their system means that I can walk in with, you know, my phone or any other AR or VR tech, and I'm able to say things like, oh yeah, I already know that that's a whiteboard and that's a phone and that's a Kleenex box. Um, and I'm able to do it from any angle, in any lighting, regardless of where I am in the world. And, um, and that proliferation is really going to see an uptick in not only AR and kind of fun video game sort of things and, and multi-interactional pieces, but also things like manufacturing repair, right? If you're going into a, uh, the inside of a circuit board and you're able to take your phone and you're able to scan around and say, Okay, it looks like you know this valve is probably broken from any angle and it's able to put a label in real time. That's what people are starting to see getting tested now and will expand in one to three years. 
The last is what I call the magical $49, you know, AI camera, which is on its way. A lot of people are starting to think about hardware, but the hardware is really expensive. It's in the multi hundred or multi thousand dollars. When you start to think about edge computing, it's, you know, who is providing these cameras? Can it do the inferencing and the speed that we need to? Is it the right resolution? Who's coming in to set it up? Who's coming in to support it? And no one's really created this like magical $49 camera, right? What, what Ring did for security cameras, people are looking for this quick grab and go computer vision, buy it from you know Amazon and just throw it up without any plugins. That is what the world is waiting for and it's, it's starting to happen um, in computer vision today. Machine learning, right? So machine learning tends to be more structured data. Uh, these are two very quick examples. Let's say that you are a you know retail website, you have click data, age, gender, how much that person spent, all these pieces about your customer. And you're able to put those into a model and based on everyone who's done anything in the last year, and you're able to map it to, all right, what they next bought or the uh, website that they next clicked on or the you know media recommendation that they next viewed, that question becomes, all right, what should I serve them next? And that's why Amazon Personalize came out. What is their likelihood to rent again in the next four months? That's prediction. That's our new forecast API. Uh, another more like manufacturing IoT example is you have things like weight loads. We're talking about elevators. How many trips has this elevator taken? How many floors did it travel per day? And we're able to predict, when is this elevator likely gonna break? And let's also not wait until it's broken. Let's send a repair person in a week before we think it's gonna break and have them fix it and update the tech today. Where ML is going in the future is the exact same situation, but with more data or less data, right? So in this retail example, not only do you have your own personal retail website information, but you also have things like global weather data and global commodity tracking, right? If we have all these pieces like click date, et cetera, but I also know that the price of 20% cotton and 80% polyester mix is 83% likely to increase by 1% in five days. What am I gonna do based on my marketing spend, based on my media recommendations, uh, based on that new data? And so we're gonna see this proliferation of globally available real-time data sources that we're not really seeing today. Next piece is, is uh, one shot or a few shot training. All that means is, hey, I don't wanna have a million examples of an elevator breaking down because you're not going to have it. Um, but you only want like one example or five examples of what we call edge cases, which is like a rare occurrence, uh, an unlikely occurrence to be able to say, all right, I'm gonna feed this ML model one example of a malfunction and it'll be much more accurate in predicting when an elevator will malfunction. Last slide, which is the, I, I always like to call it the parts people forget about, but shouldn't, I used to call it the bonus section and, and people were like, it shouldn't be a bonus, it's part of the main category, is uh, the, these three kind of larger categories centered around design and business and what I th like to think of the goodness of AI. So not the literal tech, but who's coming into the world of AI. Uh, how is AI being presented back to the user? And so it's gonna be, you know, ML is gonna become more accessible and less taxing. ML makers, note that I didn't say machine learning engineers or data scientists, but ML makers will be more ages, more level of ability, education level, uh, familiarity with AI, their background, whether they're a designer or a you know customer support agent, a subject matter expert. We're seeing this proliferation of AI tooling to be able to give access to the non-machine learning engineer so that people can, for example, grab a pre-trained uh, API, right? So the example, let's say it's speech to text and able to put it in an everyday mobile app, a website, you know, any sort of customer experience. And so the expectation is that Yes, there will be these you know, fancy customized versions where hardcore MLEs or machine learning engineers and data scientists can really dig in and customize. But the other part is that it's like, AI is just really important. 
and 80% of the people are going to need a grab and go piece to just put it into their, you know, everyday business workflow to improve cost, to improve churn, to improve metrics and performance and monetization um, by somewhere between, you know, five and 50%. These are things that every business is aching for. The second piece, which applies to both of these groups, both the, you know, um, non MLEs and the MLEs, machine learning engineers, is this automation of undifferentiated DevOps um, that we see in machine learning. So part of machine learning is this really cool, what data is coming in, what data is coming out, what are we predicting, what are the models, how are they performing? And then there's this taxing part of machine learning, which is, you know, how many instances do I need to spin up based on how much data is coming in? Uh, what type of inferencing speed do I need for this level of data? How can I uh, more quickly send it to a customer support agent? And those are pieces that no one should really be thinking about. Those are pieces that should be automated in the same way that today a website can be created in 15 minutes. Right? So we're starting to see this movement of automation of the very, very bottom percent of creating ML models. Uh, there's a product called SageMaker that Amazon released um, November 2017 that is doing this, that's spinning up instances and taking them down so that cost is minimized based on exactly what training input and hyperparameters, all those pieces that you give your ML model so you can kind of focus on the cool stuff. The, the next piece, uh, and this is the slide's going to be up for a bit. This is a very, very important topic, um, and I call it the, the four pillars of explainability. So a lot of people talk about bias. Uh, I was on the computer vision team when all of the news about face recognition came out and the bias within facial recognition technology and how it underperformed for certain ethnicities and ages and genders. That is one piece of this explainability puzzle that everyone is focused on, the media, the news, big tech, small tech. And really it's, it's four pieces. And I would encourage you all to think about where these four pieces would fit into your ML story, your ML journey. One is data lineage. And I'm sure when you think about GDPR, you get goosebumps or PTSD and you don't wanna to go to sleep, but data lineage is critical. And as we think about more raw data inputs, right? As I said, like that commodity tracking input or your click data or face recognition data, you're gonna want to know where did this raw data come from? How am I combining it? Who has touched it? What cities and countries and regions has it been in? So keeping track of that data lineage, where it's been is gonna be critical in explainability and bias and accuracy and transparency. The next, which is kind of a, an abstraction from that level of data is called product lineage. So from that data, from that mound of data, and I'll go back to the cats and dogs example, we have a million pictures of cats and dogs and the computer is able to, to take that as, as labeled input and it's able to create a model footprint, right? That was that 15 megabyte thing that, that lived on your phone. So it's able to create a model based on those millions of images and it's a small uh, model of, of those, those inputs and outputs and what we can expect to see out of new performance. That model footprint can be viewed as a product and, and where that model footprint goes is just as important as where the raw data goes. So where it's been, who has altered it. If you're a company that's thinking about licensing your model footprints, going back to that cake example, if you're gonna license everything except for the frosting, being able to say where those core components of a neural net have been, that again is gonna be critical, especially as you start to think about risk, compliance, performance, getting your next raise, where's your IP, uh, product lineage is just as critical as data. Next is, uh, you know, a lot of companies are thinking and working on accuracy and bias. So accuracy is, you know, how, how well did I answer this question? And bias is, is there a substantive patterned way that I'm overperforming on certain um, inputs and underperforming on others. So the example is that face recognition technology was very much trained on Caucasian faces and there's also higher contrast in Caucasian faces versus um, people of color and faces of color that might have less uh, light contrast, less um, 
uh, data inputs, right? So all these public data sources tend to be skewed toward one ethnicity. And thinking about how do we not release that into the wild and how do we know that that bias exists and how do we um, have a machine learning model tell us before we launch and in the QA process say, you have this bias, you must go out and fix it. Um, and, and not only say, you know, likely this bias occurs, but giving raw numbers and, and benchmarks against it so that we're releasing the best technology. And I'm sure you guys can think about that, you know, certain use cases, it is even more critical to think about bias. Obviously, we never want to release um, overly biased technologies, but AI is not perfect. We have to release things that are not 100% uh, accurate. And, and that is one piece that I tell all of my customers, which is don't aim for perfection. It's always improving. There's always that feedback loop, right? How, how often is a Netflix recommendation absolutely perfect? I've seen terrible stand-up comedy recommendations, and that's okay. We're not expecting perfection. And so we need to think about what is that optimization strategy so that we're always improving and not settling for less. And then the last piece is risk and compliance. So not where does it underperform, but literally what explain to me, why did it do what it did? And I'll go back to the example of, of cat and dog. You know, if it said it's 98% confident that it's a husky, what if I then received a heat map of, okay, the ears are very husky, you know, compared to a cat or the eye color is really husky compared to a cat. So people are starting to think about how do we surface that transparency, that heat map in the world of language, computer vision, ML models, you know, why did I give the mortgage loan to this family and not to that family? Those are pieces that in the world of compliance, you need to start thinking about when you're building this product so that if anyone asks, why did you do what you did? You can go straight to the data and be able to show that. And that's also very big in the healthcare space, FinTech, et cetera. Last piece, is kind of this all-encompassing privacy as it relates to user experience and overall product integrity. If I'm thinking about, you know, Uber or any ride share and I and I click and I'm I'm getting matched to a driver, obviously they're using machine learning to match me to a driver based on distance or rating or all those pieces. As an end consumer, I don't need to know why they picked that driver for me. I just need to know that that's a driver, here's their photo, here's their rating. That being said, if I'm in a healthcare situation and it says it's returning a diagnosis or a drug recommendation, I'm absolutely going to want more data. Why did it do what it say it did and more depth? And if I'm an end user who's a data scientist, then I might even want an even deeper level of detail, which is don't just tell me why it did what it did, Show me the literal model, show me the output, show me graphs, show me knowledge graphs. And it's really this whole spectrum based on your end user and based on your use case of kind of clear and helpful to maybe creepy, you know, do I need to know exactly why they match this driver to me, to overwhelming. I don't need that level of data. Um, the, the next piece, which is related to product feedback, right? If I uh, receive a Netflix recommendation that I loved, I'm giving a thumbs up, maybe I didn't like it, thumbs down. A lot of companies are starting to think about the new age of, of AI uh, responses. So a lot of people right now are doing thumbs up, thumbs down. There's a lot of you know one to five stars. Um, what if the user feedback loop was um, blinking or a quick one sentence uh, voice record or, you know, a quick tap of your smart ring. Lots of uh, companies are starting to think about like the new age AI UX and how people can submit um, feedback in a much broader way and at times a much faster way. Um, and always thinking about what disclosure, what UX is perfect for your end consumer. Do I need someone to qu give a quick thumbs up, thumbs down? Do I need to show that something is AI powered? How important is it to even say that machine learning is powering that decision versus just giving a really, really good, clear, uh, friction-free and delightful customer experience? Um, so even though you know AI is extremely important and it's gonna proliferate every single industry, every startup, every big tech, 
you know, how often do we really need to be telling everyone that this is AI driven and how often can it just be a really great experience? So that is the presentation. It is a whirlwind of ML tech. Uh, I, I welcome your questions. As I said, this is uh, not meant to be a futuristic view, though. If you do have, you know, where is AI going in the future sense, I just ask that you don't ask about Skynet. Answer it every single time. But please contact me on LinkedIn, Twitter. I think I have a Toggle account under the exact same screen name. Uh, my username is Ali K. Miller on pretty much every platform. I love to engage uh, with folks on LinkedIn, Twitter, and everything else. My email address is imally at amazon.com. Feel free to reach out if you have an AI use case that you'd like to talk through. I know I've got Ben and a couple other teammates on the phone. So it's been great talking, I guess, at you and, and for the next few minutes with you about AI ML. It's a huge passion spot of mine and definitely a passion spot for our entire team and company for the next, well, for the rest of the future. So thank you so much and uh, can't wait to hear what questions you guys, has, you guys have. And thank you, Christina, for hosting.